Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Pancreatic Cancer Challenges and Solutions, presented by Dr. Lynn Matrosian, Chief Science Officer at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots. LabRoots is the leading scientific social networking website and producer of educational virtual events and webinars. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located at the lower left of your presentation window, type that question into the box and it, that appears on the screen and we'll answer as many as we can toward the end of the presentation. Also, notice that you'll be viewing this presentation in the slide window. To enlarge that window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or use that Q&A button and let us know you're having a problem. Good news, this presentation is educational and offers educational continuing credits. Click on the button at the bottom left-hand corner to follow and, and obtain your credits. Please join me now in welcoming our presenter, Dr. Lynn Matrician. I will now turn the presentation over to her. Welcome, Dr. Matrician. Hello, thank you, Susie. So I'll be talking today about pancreatic cancer, the challenges and solutions of this deadly disease. Let's talk first about the challenges. So pancreatic cancer is the 12th most common cancer. Um, so it is not one we hear a lot about. It is um, about 3.2% of all the new cancer cases. And we hear mostly about the big four, breast cancer, prostate, lung, and colorectal cancer. So it's not a cancer that's particularly on our horizon at most times. However, pancreatic cancer is projected to be the second major cancer killer around the year 2020. It is the third major kill killer right now. It surpassed breast cancer this year in the number of cancer deaths in the United States. And it's on track to surpass colorectal cancer around the year 2020 to become second only to lung cancer as a major cancer killer. So it's one that we need to spend more attention to, more to pay more attention to as we go forward. So primarily I'm talking about pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, or PDAC. It represents 95% of all the pancreatic cancer histologies. In addition, there is neuroendocrine pancreatic cancer and several other um, histological types, but we'll um, focus particularly on PDAC. It has a five-year survival rate in the single digits, and so is considered one of the deadliest or a recalcitrant cancer. And that's a definition that's de defined legislatively as cancers with a five-year relative survival rate of less than 50%. So this represents, of the major cancers, the deadliest within that category. The reason is, for one reason, it's diagnosed late. Only about 15% of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma cases are resectable and go to surgery. And it's characterized by about 95% of these cases have as their driver mutations in the oncogene KRAS. It has, it's also distinctive in that it has a very robust stroma. And you can see from the H&E on this slide 
that there are islands of pancreatic cancer cells within a sea of the pink stroma or the desmoplastic response to those cancer cells. This causes an elevated pressure within the tumor. It prevents, it collapses blood vessels and prevents um, adequate nutri nutrition and oxygen to reach those um, cancer cells, so they become very hypoxic. Um, and it prevents chemotherapies from reaching those cells. So it's a, a distinctive characteristic of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And in addition, um, PDACs are immunologically cold. So it's very, we've had a difficult time in finding immunotherapies that are effective against this cancer type. So this presents great challenges for um, pancreatic cancer. So at the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network, we set a goal in 2011 to double survival by 2020 and started a number of initiatives with this goal in mind. So our organization is really focused on, um, on this. All of our activities um, are really centered around reaching this goal. Um, and in another couple years, we'll need to set a new goal as we use this as the foundation to make really substantial advances against this cancer type. So let's talk about the solutions, some of the solutions that we've come up with um, to attack this cancer. So our plan is, for one thing, we realize that there's not, that research is um, essential, more research in this field. We need to increase and influence both government and private funding for research in pancreatic cancer. We need to increase the clinical trial enrollment rate, so clinical research. We need to get more patients onto trial so we can learn faster. We need to promote running smart clinical trials, so the clinical trials that are um, ongoing need to be very focused um, on, on increasing um, survival for this cancer. We need to identify the best practice and disseminate them across the country. There's a lot of variability in the treatment of pancreatic cancer. There are um, community oncologists who only see a couple pancreatic cancer patients a year. They don't necessarily do well. And so there are also centers of excellence that really focus on this disease. And so we need to learn from those centers of excellence and disseminate that information to all um, oncologists that treat pancreatic cancer. And we need to heighten public awareness and raise more money for this disease. And so that um, creates a real sense of urgency as we march towards our 2020 goal um, to, to accomplish these goals. So first, in increasing influencing government and private funding for research, the National Cancer Institute provides um, a little over 80% of the pancreatic cancer funding within the United States. And so our advocacy efforts as a patient advocacy group have helped to influence um, the funding levels for pancreatic cancer within the National Cancer Institute. We've seen a dramatic increase, a five-fold increase in NCI funding devoted to pancreatic cancer um, since the inception of the, the beginning of the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network in 1999, um, and some dramatic increases in recent years. In part, this is due to continual advocacy, um, going to the Hill um, and making sure our uh, elected representatives are aware of the role the National Cancer Institute um, and the National Institutes of Health play in um, funding research for this disease. And it's also as a result of a specific bill called the Recalcitrant Cancer Research Act. This is a bill that was introduced um, several times. Um, it became um, it passed Congress in 2012 and was enacted into law by President Obama in January of 2013. It was a, an enormous um, advocacy effort that resulted in the passage of this bill. And what the bill did was ask the NCI to develop a scientific framework for pancreatic cancer. It had no appropriations, but it asked for a strategic plan um, for the NCI to devote efforts towards pancreatic cancer. The result was a, um, a, um, a group that came together, a group of scientists, 
that identified four priority areas for pancreatic cancer research. And the NCI has been very responsive um, to those priority areas. They have set up um, consortiums and different initiatives to address each of these in, um, since that bill was passed in 2013. There is a, an effort at the Frederick National Laboratory to focus particularly on RAS-driven um, um, cancers. And so since pancreatic cancer is 95% um, of PDACs are driven by um, alterations in the uh, oncogene KRAS, that this, these efforts to try to drug what's been considered an undruggable target um, have really been um, catalyzed by this effort through the National, uh, the Frederick National uh, Laboratory. The relationship between diabetes and pancreatic cancer has been investigated through a um, partnership with the NIDBK and the NCI, resulting in the consortium to study chronic pancreatitis, diabetes, and pancreatic cancer. Early detection of pancreatic cancer has been funded through a pancreatic cancer detection consortium, and immunotherapy approaches to pancreatic cancer um, are, is the most recent initiative. Um, the consortium for, for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma studies on the tumor microbiome is really focused on understanding um, the, the immune system in the microenvironment of pancreatic cancer. And there's been um, committed funding, funding that is going into each, each of these initiatives um, and, and these um, initiatives will continue in the future years um, to provide some of the much needed research um, in this cancer. In addition, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network has a competitive peer review grants program. We've invested over $40 million over, um, since, since the um, program started in 2003, giving um, grants to over 58 institutions across the United States with a very concerted effort to form a community for progress um, to make sure that the pancreatic cancer investigators know each other, that they're collaborating, um, that they're working together um, to provide the research on this disease. So in addition, we've been working on increasing the clinical trial enrollment rate for this cancer type. And this really focuses on our, uh, a resource that we've had since 2002, a call center that we call Patient Central. So a place for one-to-one -one support for patients and caregivers um, that, are, um, that are facing pancreatic cancer. So our highly trained associates on the telephone um, give information, customize that information to what that individual is asking at that particular time, giving information on disease and tr treatments, on clinical trials, on support resources that they might be interested um, at every step along their journey. There's an education packet that's mailed within 24 hours providing information on the disease, um, recommendations to go to a high volume center for, for a second opinion or for treatment. Um, and each um, person who calls, if they call back again at a later time, will be reconnected with the same associate so they can pick up where they left off um, and continue that conversation. So one of the um, a, a very important part of the service, service that's provided by Patient Central is our clinical trial database. And this database is kept up to date on a monthly basis. We call, it, call around to all clinical trials that are open, and there's approximately 160 clinical trials open for pancreatic cancer at any one time within the United States. And we get up-to-date information on the sites that those um, trials are open, whether they are open, that we can give that information to um, patients as they ask. In addition, this database is available to patients online um, through our clinical trial finder. And it's available to healthcare professionals to do searches to look at the landscape of clinical trials throughout the United States. So because we have a relationship with trial sponsors throughout the United States, every three years we do an analysis of, of the number of pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma patients that went on clinical trials um, in that particular year. 
Our national average in 2011 was 3.8% of, of the prevalence of the number of pancreatic cancer patients in the United States went on clinical trials in that year. It increased slightly in 2014 to 4.2%. But we find that patient central callers, those that um, call us, that get clinical trial information, and that respond to a survey, we find 12% of those go on um, clinical trials. So helping to buy through the information that's available through clinical trial finder and through this clinical trial database and our patient central associates, um, to, we find this, um, we find that the knowledge about clinical trials helps increase the clinical trial enrollment rate. So if patients go on clinical trials, they need to be smart clinical trials. They need to be ones that will really advance the future. So we, as at the Pancreatic Cancer um, Action Network, we have taken a look at um, the pancreatic cancer clinical trials across the United States and looked in particular at the phase three clinical trials that have led to changes in the standard of care for this disease. So we did an analysis, looked at, there were 39 phase three um, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma trials from 1992 to 2015. But of those, um, we really only resulted in three clinically meaningful changes in the standard of care um, during that time period. So that's a less than 10% success. And so why have we not been so effective in clinical trials um, within this disease? So it, it, we looked at some of the reasons um, and some of them related to there were phase there were phase two clinical trials that were done in advance of the phase three clinical trials for um, only a percentage of those, of those phase three clinical trials. And it turned out even if those phase two trials didn't always meet their, second, sec their primary endpoint, they still went on to phase three clinical trials. And so we found that trusting meeting a phase two endpoint um, was predictive of the, the outcome of phase three clinical trials 76% of the time. Um, and so that that would, um, even if the endpoints were different. Um, and so the, um, in essence, looking at the data, not being over optimistic about the results of phase two trials would help predict um, a, a, a response in a phase three trial. In addition, we sent some, bench, some benchmarks um, using this retrospective data that might be useful for prospective or future um, phase three clinical trials, um, certain um, benchmarks for overall survival, one year survival, and progression free survival in phase two trials that might help predict uh, effectiveness in um, our, the endpoint in the outcome of a phase three trial. And so had we, looking back again retrospectively on the phase three clinical trials within the pancreatic cancer space, um, had we set these benchmarks for the phase two trials before going on to phase three, there was 11, more than 11,000 patients that um, could have been reallocated to, for instance, more phase two trials, looking at other treatment approaches to these, um, to pancreatic cancer. In addition, we, um, we think that as we look back that we've been thinking about pancreatic cancer as pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, that's one size fits all. That, um, and so there has been no molecular, uh, there's been very little precision medicine um, thinking about molecular indicators, molecular drivers of pancreatic cancer that can result in um, changes in the standard of care and targeted therapies. So this has been successful in other cancers and, and certainly the famous chronic myelogenous leukemia, um, imatinib, um, and a number of other cancer types. There are targeted therapies that for a subset of patients um, in, in the solid tumors for a subset of patients that can be matched then with a the targeted therapy and really change um, the survival um, and the standard of care um, within those disease types. So we looked at that in pancreatic cancer, realized um, three years ago 
three or four years ago that there was really um, not a lot of work that was being done in this field and that there was a lot of skepticism that molecular targeting was going to work in pancreatic cancer, in particular because so many of those tumors were driven by PLRAS alterations, um, which was um, and still is undruggable. But we decided that we needed to um, to ask that question and find out whether there were molecular alterations, targeted alterations in pancreatic cancer. So we started Know Your Tumor program, taking advantage of the, um, the patients that call Patient Central and the access to, um, um, to, those, to those individuals. So the Know Your Tumor works by patients that call Patient Central. Um, if they meet the eligibility requirements, which are quite broad, um, but that we have to be able to obtain a biopsy, get tumor tissue from these patients, and we have to have enough time for the results to come back before they need to make their next treatment decision. We partner with Prothera. Um, Prothera gains the case patient consent, assists with obtaining the biopsy, the, the tissue is centralized in Prothera's laboratories, and then sent out for testing to commercial testing laboratories. At the moment, we're using foundation medicine for next generation sequencing and neogenomics for immunohistochemistry. The results then come back to Prothera. They're consolidated, both the proteomics and the next generation sequencing results are put into a, um, a report that is then lists treatment options for that patient based not only on the molecular alterations that are observed, but on the patient's treatment history and then the, and the other information that's available about the current state of the pancreatic cancer field. Um, that report is sent to the treating physician and to the patient and to the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Um, we follow up with the patient, Prothera follows up with um, the patient and the physician um, and get outcomes data, which is then analyzed. The patient is also um, encouraged to um, put additional information into our patient reported um, registry. So the Know Your Tumor program has been going on since June of 2014. We've enrolled over 1,300 patients with over 700 reports that have come back at this point in time. We're successful 91% of the time in obtaining biopsies that we can obtain um, next generation sequencing and immunohistochemistry with. And if um, and overall we're 99, we're successful 99% of the time if we get sometimes um, additional um, treatments. But it's 91% successful um, kind of off the bat um, for these patients. 35% of the patients come from community physicians. Um, and this is again a, a, a incidence where the patient is often requesting um, that the physician, especially in community settings, perform molecular testing since it is not routine um, in this cancer type. And we have um, enrolled um, patients into this program throughout 48 states. Um, what we find is that the Know Your Tumor program also helps with clinical trial enrollment. So clinical trials are listed as an option on those reports that come back. Um, and we find we can increase um, the clinical trial enrollment for patients that undergo the Know Your Tumor program to 21%. So another way that we can encourage patients to enroll in clinical trials. We have anecdotal evidence, um, lots of stories about patients where we've identified a rare um, molecular alteration in their pancreatic cancer and um, suggested either a clinical trial or off-label treatment with a targeted therapy that has been a, um, a, that is has been shown to be effective in another cancer type, um, and I've seen some some really um, nice responses in those cases. Linda was treated with um, a, a drug that's used in melanoma often for a BRAF V600E mutation, um, and um, responded nicely. Um, with, with significant tumor reductions and is certainly feeling much better. Um, in addition, we do collect outcomes from the Know Your Tumor patient. Um, we have a 
from the first 640 reports that we got. We have analyzed that data and have a manuscript that's currently in review. Um, we find that 27% of the pancreatic cancer patients that, we, that come through this program have highly actionable alterations. We define them as ones where there is evidence in um, other cancer types that there are um, responses um, to a targeted therapy that's directed to that alteration. alteration. Another 23% have alterations that indicate a pathway might be activated for which there is a targeted therapy, but very little evidence that um, that targeted therapy will be effective. And another 50% where we really see no um, molecularly indicated um, any alterations that have a targeted therapy that would be molecularly indicated. So the type of results that we see um, are shown here. About 15% of patients have alterations in DNA damage repair pathways. For instance, in the breast cancer genes, BRCA1 or BRCA2, or other genes within um, that are related to DNA damage repair. There are ones that indicate um, mTOR or AKT inhibitor may be effective, and a number of other um, at very low prevalence alterations in things like RET, um, NTRAC, BRAF, ALK, um, ROS that are fusions or all, um, mutations that indicate um, the possibility of, of a treatment response to a specifically targeted therapy to those alterations. Um, we also test for microsatellite instability um, with these patients. Um, so the outcomes data, we have again started to collect outcomes data. It's still well um, initial in these, um, pretty early in terms of getting outcomes from these patients. But we find that 81% of patients that receive a um, know your tumor report choose treatment options that are presented in the report. Um, some of these are standard of care treatments that are the, um, the options that are really the, uh, available to this, these patients. 16% um, have gone on to off-label targeted therapies as a result of the report, and 21% have gone on clinical trials. So if we look at progression-free survival, and um, second line and third line treatment for these patients who have gone on a targeted therapy that was um, indicated by the number two report, we can start to get some um, outcome data. So if we look at those um, individuals with highly actionable alterations that went on a match therapy where we have outcome, uh, progression-free survival outcome results, um, we see a, a median progression-free survival of 4.1 months. And when we compare that to those with no highly actionable alterations, um, they have a median progression-free survival of 2.8 months, so about a 50% increase in survival related to this. There are some patients that have highly actionable alterations that went on an unmatched therapy, and in those cases, um, the, the, um, the median progression-free survival is not statistically different from the no actionable, no highly actionable alteration. But there is a statistical difference between the highly actionable alterations with match therapy and those with no highly actionable alterations. And so this is encouraging in terms of in those um, that one that one size doesn't fit all in those incidences where we can identify a, a molecularly targeted therapy um, that these patients um, have responded um, with increased survival. So the Know Your Tumor program is dependent on the clinical trials that are open in um, across the United States. Um, we keep track of those clinical trials and have looked um, throughout the, the last couple years at any trends and changes in the landscape of um, PDAC um, clinical trials. Um, what we have observed is an increase in the clinical trials with targeted therapies over the past um, five years, between 2011 and 2015. Um, again, a, a marked increase in, um, in the number of trials with targeted therapy, and in particular, those trials are in the second or 
um, are third line settings. So they are individuals who have um, who have a recurrent disease after previous treatment, uh, recurrent metastatic disease. Um, and so we see again um, an encouraging trend towards an increase in the recognition um, that targeted therapy can be um, applied to um, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Um, the patients then that go through Know Your Tumor program, a lot of times we, um, the clinical trials we indicate if they are rare alterations um, and there are no um, clinical trials specifically for pancreatic cancer for those alterations, we take advantage of national efforts um, by the NCI, the NCI MATCH trial that has 24 treatment arms open, including several um, um, drugs that target several of the uh, low prevalence alterations that we've seen in pancreatic cancer. And ASCO's TAPER trial, in addition, um, gives us access to uh, um, 15 treatment arms that are open. And again, several, um, it includes several drugs that are targeted to low prevalence alterations that we see um, through the Know Your Tumor program. In addition, there are some molecularly targeted clinical trials that are open for pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. Um, one is the POLO trial, um, the, um, which is testing the um, PARP inhibitor oliparib um, in patients that have BRCA mutations, that have germline BRCA mutations. Um, and testing the effectiveness of a PARP inhibitor. So the um, mutations in the in genes in the in the BRCA pathway are um, alter the ability of um, the cells to repair double-stranded breaks in the DNA that are often called caused by chemotherapy or that are um, as a result of um, ge genomic instability um, in the pancreatic cancer. Um, that, however, there's an alternative. If that repair pathway is, um, is, is ineffective, there is an alternative pathway that uses the enzyme PARP, poly-ADP ribose polymerase. Um, and so the combination of having a defect in the um, repair enzymes in the BRCA pathway and um, um, adding a small molecular um, inhibitor, a drug that, that targets PARP, um, results in death of those cancer cells, the inability to repair that damage and cancer death. And so that's a, um, a very um, targeted therapy that's being applied to pancreatic cancer specifically and to those individuals that have alterations in DNA repair pathways. Um, in addition, there, um, we've, had, we've had some success in pancreatic cancer with immunotherapy and in particular with a subset of patients um, that are uh, microsatellite unst unstable or who have defects in DNA repair that lead to thousands of somatic mutations that increase the, um, the mutational burden in these patients. And that is a signal for, um, for the immune system. And so in those cases, um, a, a PD-1 inhibitor, um, for instance, um, pembrolizumab, um, has been FDA approved now in solid tumors um, which includes pancreatic cancer for individuals that have a molecular indication of being microsatellite unstable or having mismatch repair um, deficiency. Um, and so this is estimated to be about 2 to 3% of pancreatic cancer patients who have um, the molecular signatures for uh, microsatellite inst instability or mismatch repair um, deficiencies and that can be treated now on label um, with a, the FDA approved um, um, PD-1 inhibitor. So again, advances in, um, in pancreatic cancer that are molecularly driven. And finally, there's a clinical trial um, that is using molecular information to, for a targeted therapy that targets the stroma. Um, so this very robust stroma response that we see in pancreatic cancer, one of the components of that desmoplastic response is hyaluronic acid. It's part of the matrix or the, uh, the stroma in pancreatic cancer. And it um, causes, it is in part responsible for um, the increased pressure within these tumors. So they're, um, they're, um, the drug um, 
pH 20 um, by halozyme and the clinical trial HALO301 um, uses um, this hyaluronidase um, to break down the hyaluronic acid within pancreatic cancer, within the stroma, um, to release the pressure. It's given in combination with um, gemcitabine plus abraxate. So patients are being screened for the presence of high levels of hyaluronic acid and then um, randomized um, to receive um, this pegylated recombinant hyaluronidase in combination with gemcitabine and napaflitaxel in a clinical trial that will test a targeted therapy, peg pH 20, um, for um, disruption of the stroma. So this is a, um, a very um, exciting advance in the pancreatic cancer field um, to have these molecularly targeted trials that are specific for one of the real challenges in pancreatic cancer. So the way that um, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network is thinking about these advances in um, precision medicine, precision oncology, these advances in using molecular information from a tumor for the treatment of pancreatic cancer is that it's, we're probably going to need to use these molecular approaches in combination. And so the overall goal is a molecularly driven precision medicine, the combinatorial approach to pancreatic cancer therapy, identifying targets within the stroma that can be targeted, within the tumor itself, the tumor alterate, the um, DNA alterations um, within the tumor itself that can be targeted, as well as identifying um, um, the immune system, um, how the immune system can be targeted, and putting these three approaches together um, to, for a really comprehensive approach to pancreatic cancer. So with this in mind, um, the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network has started a new initiative that tries to take advantage of what we've learned in pancreatic cancer and putting it together under one roof that we are um, initiating a clinical trial and research platform that we call Precision Promise. Precision Promise um, is um, run by a steering committee um, supported by the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. It includes a clinical trial consortium, so 12 sites, um, clinical trial sites throughout the United States um, that will um, enroll patients onto clinical trials. And it also includes a research platform, so um, for, for translational and clinically relevant research that can then transition into the Precision Promise platform. Um, we have the 12 sites have been identified, and we're anticipating that the clinical trial that's being developed within Precision Promise will launch within 2018. Um, so we are, the, um, the goal of this is to place these clinical trials under one umbrella so that we can more rapidly learn from um, within the pancreatic cancer space and advance the field more rapidly. So we have both Know Your Tumor and Precision Promise. Um, they both incorporate um, molecular profiles, um, molecularly driven oncology into um, their approach. For Know Your Tumor, we can enroll patients from anywhere across the country. For Precision Promise, patients will enroll at one of the 12 clinical trial consortium sites. Know Your Tumor is open for all patients except for newly diagnosed patients because of the time that's required to get the molecular profile information back. Um, so those patients will need to start treatment um, immediately, but then use their molecular profile for their next treatment decision. Precision Promise will be open for metastatic patients, for newly diagnosed um, and second line treatment patients, um, so that we will be able to accommodate newly diagnosed patients within the Precision Promise um, platform. Um, patients can enroll in um, clinical trials through Know Your Tumor, any clinical trial across the United States. Precision Promise will be running its own um, cl 
clinical trials through, um, through a Bayesian adaptive trial design, which includes many arms that will, in essence, rotate in and out of precision promise. So they'll both contribute to the knowledge gained to improve treatment options. Um, and in essence, through this approach, we um, have treatments that um, we think will advance um, pancreatic cancer research um, for patients throughout the United States regardless. Um, they can either enroll through your tumor or precision promise, once precision promise opens. So in addition, we need to identify the best practice and disseminate them across the country. Um, we do this um, at least in part through um, the patient registry. So the patient registry was set up as a way to understand um, the, what the journeys that patients are taking in both high volume centers as well as across the United States. It is a, um, a registry where patients um, determine their own um, privacy settings and their access settings um, for, for their own information. It is made up of 20 some different um, surveys that patients then take and tell us more about their diagnosis about their treatments and side effects. Um, there's an opportunity to upload molecular profiling information, lab tests, symptom management, family history, and then their medical history. Um, we have been, this is a, um, an, an initiative that's been in place a little over a year now. We have over a thousand new profiles and 5,000 surveys that have been started, 50 states plus the District of Columbia and 24 countries outside of the United States are, um, have been um, it, um, helping us by giving, providing us information through the patient registry. Um, we find users have a very strong desire to share their information, both with other researchers and other patients. Um, most of the users are patients. Um, and um, we also, um, it's, there's also the opportunity for caregivers to, to provide information as well. We've started to mine this data, um, looking in particular, our first project was to look at um, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, or PERT, um, and the symptomatic response. We find that 75% of the registry participants are aware um, of enzyme replacement therapy as a um, as a, for management of symptoms of um, gastric dysfunction, um, inability to appropriately digest um, food and, and, and take up nutrients um, for these patients who have um, an alter, you know, who have pancreatic cancer and whose um, pancreas and their uh, exocrine function is compromised. Um, we find that of those. Um, individuals that are taking um, enzyme replacement therapy, 61% of, the, of them are taking them as it's recommended. So there are individuals who are taking it either before meals or after meals, but not during meals. Um, and we find that those that, ends, that end up taking their, um, their enzymes during their meal record a much greater alleviation of symptoms of feeling of indigestion. Um, and so it's this kind, this is an example of the kind of information that we can start to learn uh, and perhaps raise the, the goal is to raise awareness across the United States that it may not be sufficient to simply prescribe um, pancreatic enzymes to your pancreatic cancer patients, but it may be essential to really follow up and make sure they're using them appropriately um, to alleviate the symptoms. So we are collecting um, data through our patient central, through our trial finder, our patient registry, know your tumor and precision promise. These are all different initiatives that we have that we are both helping patients individually as well as learning from those patients. And so we are um, publishing that information, making sure it gets disseminated across the United States. Um, and we're also undergoing initiatives to make sure that that, that research those, um, is also available to researchers across the United States. And this will be through, for instance, through um, data use agreements um, to use the information that the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network um, has, been, um, has been and will um, acquire 
um, as they're through these initiatives that are designed to not only help current patients, but to help future patients as well. And finally, we really need to make sure that one of the, um, the um, challenges with pancreatic cancer is really a lack of awareness across the United States um, in order um, to achieve the goal of doubling survival by 2020. We have an amazing um, volunteer network. We are, have a presence in more than nine communities across the United States. We have an affiliate network and our affiliates raise awareness through our Purple Stride events. They raise revenue for the organization to accomplish the initiatives um, that we've outlined. Um, and to really, um, they are really um, the way that we get the word out that they are passionate volunteers about the activity and making sure that more pe people are aware of pancreatic cancer and are helping in this fight um, to, to make advances against this very deadly disease. In addition, there's a global effort that we are helping um, to organize the World Pancreatic Cancer Coalition, which is um, a coalition of more than 20 countries across the world um, where the um, advocacy groups and interested individuals have come together to look at really raising global awareness. November is Pancreatic Cancer Awareness Month, and there's Pancreatic Cancer um, Awareness Day um, um, within um, that will be worldwide that will help with this initiative um, to raise awareness for um, pancreatic cancer. So we have a multifaceted plan of attack um, to help us reach our goal of doubling survival by 2020. Um, will we make that goal? Um, we are certainly, um, it's all hands on deck um, to try to accomplish that goal. Um, we have seen advances in the five-year survival rate for pancreatic cancer, which is in kind of the gold standard metric for advances in, um, in survival in diseases. Um, when we started um, in 1999, the five-year survival rate was 4%. Um, when, we, when we declared that we would start, um, that we would double survival by 2020 and 2011, the five-year survival rate was 6%. It has increased 1% each year over the past three years to the current rate of 9% in the databases that can be compared across years. And so we think we are making um, advances. Um, we have to continue this um, until um, we hit our 2020 goal and, of course, use that as a foundation for much more sustained and substantial advances um, against this disease as we go forward. Um, we are working diligently towards that, um, towards that end. Um, and the bottom line is that there are many people um, counting on us and others and researchers to make those advances um, to make the world better for those facing pancreatic cancer. So thank you and I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Matrician, for that informative presentation and your important research. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of your presentation window, type your questions into the box that appear on your screen, and click that send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. <clears throat> We have a great audience today. Here's our first question. Dr. Matrician, how does know your tumor work? Who pays for the diagnostic tests? What about the off-label treatments? So know your tumor um, works by patients that call Patient Central, or we have some very dedicated physicians across the United States who, um, who encourage patients to enroll in, in this program. Um, the 
the molecular, we pay for Prothera's um, concierge service. We pay for the ability of Prothera to help make sure that the biopsy is done appropriately so that um, sufficient tissue can be obtained. We um, then pay for the report that's generated um, from that. The, um, the molecular analysis itself is done by certified laboratories across the United States. And those laboratories bill the patient's insurance for the molecular um, um, diagnostic test itself. Um, the, what we have found is that we have insurance has been willing to pay um, for those with um, for those alterations that 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 has been a medically indicated um, cost to insurance for um, for those diagnostic tests. Now, patients, of course, who have copays are responsible for those copays, but all the um, the molecular analysis, um, the analysis of the results and the um, treatment recommendations are provided by Prothera through the resources that we pay. Now, as, as I said, the um, options can range from standard of care options to, um, which are of course provided by insurance, um, to um, off-label treatments and clinical trials. Now, the off-label treatments we have had, there are times because these treatments are not approved in pancreatic cancer, um, there has sometimes been questions about the use of those targeted therapies in pancreatic cancer. What we have found is that um, with the appropriate um, scientific information behind the use of those treatments for um, for treatment of individuals with a molecular indication um, in their tumor um, that we have been successful in getting um, insurance reimbursement for those treatments. That will take some extra work. Uh, we are happy to help um, patients with um, um, go through the process of doing that or we have, again, a number of, our, of the physicians that have been actively involved in this program have found um, that it's been very effective um, to provide that information to the insurance companies. Thank you, Dr. Matrician. And thank you again to our audience members. We have one more question from our audience. If Precision Promise is a clinical trial at 12 sites, how will it accelerate progress since accrual to clinic, clinical trials will still be limiting? So Precision Promise is taking the approach that we can accelerate progress by more rap by putting um, different drugs, different tests, all under one umbrella. And it uses a Bayesian adaptive trial design, something that the FDA is very interested in these days. And we have been working very closely with the FDA to work out the trial design um, so that um, so that drugs can be approved through this process using much fewer numbers of patients than have been traditionally um, needed for phase three clinical trials. So um, what we find is that we can share controls. So instead of each phase three clinical trial um, needing both controls and um, and um, the experimental arm that we can, in essence, share across the experimental arms by having controls plus a number of different experimental arms all under the Precision Promise umbrella. So in addition then, this is um, the trial design is a phase two, three clinical trial. So there can be, in essence, 
um, advancement to phase three if the phase two results are sufficient. That in essence keeps the trial going seamlessly. So it prevents the start and stop that occurs um, with traditional trial design. Um, and it reduces the number of patients that are needed because of this um, adaptive trial design, the Bayesian design of it um, is, um, it will in essence, so it accelerates, um, it reduces the number of patients by sharing controls and in essence setting up the statistics up front to be able to um, use that adaptive trial design for, um, for registration purposes. Um, and, um, and it accelerates it by having individuals, instead of starting and stopping, in essence, seamlessly going to phase three. Um, in addition, um, Precision Promise is set up so that both patients in both sec uh, first line and second line can go into um, this trial so that, in essence, there is the next step in their journey is um, already already at their fingertips. So individuals that go on clinical trials, if they find that they need to go on to another treatment option, instead of in essence starting over and looking for the next clinical trial, it's all built within that same platform. So those are a couple of the innovations that Precision Promise um, offers. Um, to pancreatic cancer patients to try to accelerate the process of clinical development. Thank you, Dr. Matrusian. Did you want to have any closing remarks for our audience before we close today? I want to thank the audience for um, their attention, for their interest in pancreatic cancer, um, and say that um, that as a as a community, um, we are um, we need to work together um, in order to um, combat some of the our biggest challenges, um, and that includes diseases like pancreatic cancer. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to once again thank Dr. Matrusian for her presentation. I'd also like to thank LabRoots for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to remind everyone that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through January 2017. You'll receive an email from LabRoots letting you know that the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.